Our webinar today is going to focus on the recently passed CARES Act, what provisions are in the bill, how much money is in the bill to help your communities, and what kinds of activities those funds can support. Each of your communities is about to see large amounts of money flow in from various sources, including the CARES Act and FEMA, as well as state and local funds. And your jurisdictions are now called upon to plan how to make the most uh, effective use of those funds. Our webinar today offers a framework for you to think strategically about critical activities and what funding is available to carry them out. So I wanna riff on an old adage from a colleague and say that what we want you to do is think street strategically and act accordingly. So a couple quick housekeeping notes. Uh, we definitely maxed out on the number of people uh, attending this webinar. We'll make sure to fix that for future webinars. But um, as you already know, all participants are gonna be muted except for Steve and I. And we encourage you to post your questions in the chat box and we'll do our best to address them throughout the webinar. But please note that this webinar is not going to have a Q&A period. Uh, we still will capture questions and address those that we can today, um, as well as through a series of webinars that we're hosting in the, in the coming weeks. We will post the webinar slides, the recording, and a two-pager with key takeaways for you on our website um, later today. So in order to continue this conversation um, uh, after the webinar is over, uh, and to encourage people to share with each other how they're planning to strategically use this new federal funding in their communities, we're live tweeting this webinar and plan to live tweet all of our upcoming webinars. So we will post uh, webinar related questions um, throughout the webinar at uh, the COVID webinar hashtag. And I wanna say that the Alliance is currently working on putting in place a platform where communities can share information ask questions of each other and post resources. So now I'd like to turn the webinar over to my colleague, Steve Bird, who's the Vice President of Policy and Programs for the Alliance. Steve? Okay, hello everybody. Sorry about the, uh, sorry about the technical difficulties on our end, but I think we have it fixed now. And so let's start talking about the CARES Act. Um, switch to the next slide, please. Okay, an overview of the CARES Act. People have heard about this as the $2 trillion law that Congress just passed last, and the president signed last weekend. There are a whole range of different things in there, um, specifically related to homelessness. There's $12 billion in different HUD programs, some of which we'll talk about today. There are uh, more resources for healthcare. There are individual payments to the the, the famous $1,200 payments to individuals. There are small business loans that are forgivable, um, enhancements to the unemployment insurance program, and, and large amounts of state and local government support. We're not gonna talk about everything here today, but we're gonna talk about the things we think are the most relevant to people working on homelessness. Um, overall, the picture is most of the money went to, to uh, support private business, but there is substantial support for federal, state, and local governments and the programs that they fund. And right there, you can see a, a link to a blog that has a little more detail about that. Um, so a couple of the specific things. Next slide, please. The, uh, the first thing is a $4 billion addition to the Emergency Solutions Grants Program. People who work on homelessness know that this is the uh, Emergency Solutions Grants is uh, a formula grant to state and local governments. Large and medium-sized states and counties usually get their own grant, and then there's a balance of state grant uh, to cover the rest of the state. Um, it, 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 you can use it for a range of things related to homelessness, including shelter, short, medium-term rent assistance, different kinds of supportive services, um, there are a number of things in the uh, in this supplemental legislation that sort of flex up the ESG program. Um, one is that uh, usually ESG is available for for uh, for people who are either homeless or at risk of homelessness. The, the definition of at risk of homelessness is uh, made very simple in this in this bill that anybody who's at 50% of area median income. 
Um, there's increased flexibility in a number of ways, the usual local decision-making process and planning process for ASD is minimized. Um, there's no cap on the amount that can be used for shelter. There's no match. Um, you can, a community can reimburse itself for costs that have already been incurred even before the bill passed. Um, and uh, temporary shelters, for temporary shelters, there's no environmental or habitability review. And then housing first, the one thing that uh, that is in the bill is that uh, communities can't impose requirements uh, in order for people to access the housing and services um, that they get funded by this bill. Um, the timeline and formula is still a little unclear. Uh, the last we've heard is that of the four billion, HUD is going to distribute one billion based on the current ESG formula um, very soon, and the other three billion they hope will be released based on a new formula that's a little more tightly tied to uh, needs related to coronavirus and uh, and uh, sheltered and unsheltered homelessness. People are familiar with CDBG. It's a block grant that state and local governments get. Usually it's, it's meant for building things. Usually there's a requirement that the vast majority be spent on, uh, on, on capital developments, on building things. Um, and there, but there's a small amount that can be used for what's called, uh, what's called uh, public services. Um, in, in the CDBG money that's in the stimulus bill, the, the public services cap, there is no public services cap. So the entire $5 billion uh, can be spent on services, a range of different services, including rent payments for people, um, including various things in, uh, in shelters. But this is also available for a number of other community needs. So uh, local communities will be having to s decide how much of this $5 billion to spend on homelessness and how many on other things. Um, again, the timeline for distribution is uncertain. The statute says that $2 billion should be spent, sent out just based on the uh, existing formula. There is a little more of the usual planning and, and community input requirements um, for this funding. So that might take a little longer to release, but HUD is still trying to get out quickly. Um, one other big piece that people want to look at uh, is on the next slide. Um, that is called the Coronavirus Relief Fund. This is a, a great deal more money, $150 billion. Um, meant to relieve state and local governments uh, in the light of reduced uh, reduced tax receipts based on the state of the economy. Um, there will be many different competing interests for this, but it's, it's a fund that state and local government will have available to it that could be used for things like housing and homeless assistance options. So that's something to work with people's state and local governments on. Um, and again, the, the timing of the release of that is still a little uncertain. Um, a couple of quick things besides those uh, appropriations that were in the supplemental bill. One is FEMA. Um, people are familiar with the Federal Emergency Management Agency, usually disaster assistance. FEMA it, money is available to pay for shelter, and it's it, that can include non-congregate shelter. One thing a lot of communities are standing up is they're figuring out ways to use empty hotel rooms, of which there are many in many communities, to, uh, to give private accommodations to people who are at a special risk um, from the coronavirus or, or who are older um, or else who have po tested positive for, for uh, infection. And, uh, it turn, FEMA will be able to pay for a lot of those non-congregate settings if there's a medical need for it. We're, we're waiting for more guidance to come out from FEMA, but we think that's coming soon. And there's a whole other webinar just on the topic of using, using FEMA funds um, next week. Then another thing in, in the stimulus bill was the individual payments. I mentioned uh, $1,200 for each adult, $500 for each dependent child. Um, 
everyone who has a work eligible, eligible social security number is eligible for this. We think a lot of homeless people would be able to use this money to, to uh, get themselves in a much better situation than they're in to help with a, a, a security deposit to, uh, to help support a household that they can join family and friends. So we're, we're going to be working hard to, uh, to make sure everyone who is eligible gets these funds. And I think it would be great if, uh, if you have ideas for how to make sure that people who don't have bank accounts can still get these funds, please share them with us. Um, there are other HUD programs that got additional funding in this bill. Um, most of those are smaller amounts of money than the four or five billion that I talked about already that are more aimed toward helping those programs meet their current need. I think uh, there's more money for public housing authorities who are facing a lot of administrative problems right now, and this will help with that. And then um, finally, there are eviction prevention provisions. Um, federally supported housing is supposed to put a put a stop on evictions during the public health crisis. Um, a lot of times people will, will not know which housing units in their community are federally supported, but I think you can find out, you work with your local housing authorities to find out which of the units in town are covered by that. Um, various kinds of low-income housing are, uh, are covered by that uh, eviction moratorium. Okay, next slide. Um, the other thing we want to talk, touch on briefly is some of the healthcare stuff and Medicaid in particular. Um, Medicaid, as people know, is a program that basically uh, any low-income person with a disability or any low-income person uh, who's part of a family with children or any low-income person who's over 65 is eligible for, and it pays for a whole range of different healthcare needs and healthcare-related uh, social services. Each state has a different Medicaid program. Um, they they have uh, they have lists of eligible activities. People need to find out from their states what's eligible because anything that's medically related that are is being provided for homeless people, we're hoping will be covered by Medicaid. And during the during the public health crisis, um, the federal government and Congress have made attempts to flex Medicaid up a little more. There's, it's easier to get waivers. There's a number of different kind of waivers that some states have already gotten that you can see on these two slides. So we strongly recommend, think about what homeless people need that's really medical in nature or related to medical care. Uh, find out what your state is already covering um, under Medicaid and make sure that people have access to that and then work with other people in the state to advocate for your state to uh, to go to the federal government with waiver requests as appropriate to make sure that uh, that Medicaid is easier to use and that more people have access to it. So let me stop right there because a lot there's a lot more we have to we have to uh, cover on this webinar. Um, one thing the one thing I want to say about this is that. The, the the money in this in the last supplemental for homelessness was a product of a huge uh, grassroots effort by people all over over the country. People we worked with other national organizations to make sure people knew that this, that Congress was considering this and that people around the country had an opportunity to really let them know what why you needed this money and how important it was and pe people in the field came through in a fantastic way and we could see literally on a daily basis that the mem the people in congress were hearing from their constituents and were more interested in putting more money into this so thank you all there's going to be other kinds of efforts like this in the coming weeks and we're going to be counting on that so uh Please stick with us, sign up for our advocacy alerts, and uh, we'll continue to work with Congress on these things. Thanks. So moving to our framework. So the Alliance's proposed framework for your community to effectively plan for the use of CARES Act, FEMA, local and state funds, focuses on how to use these funds to address an immediate health crisis among people experiencing homelessness. 
not primarily to address a housing crisis. It's our hope that your community will find ways to use these funds to rehouse people experiencing homelessness and improve the function of the homeless response system in your community. However, this framework is meant to support community planning efforts to ensure that people experiencing homelessness do not contract and spread the coronavirus. As funds flow into your community, this framework seeks to provide guidance in planning the most effective ways to address this health crisis. We don't yet know the most effective ways to tackle all the challenges that we're facing. However, we do know that investing newly available funds into one or a few of the components of this framework may leave your community with only a small fraction of people housed and a majority of people still living in the streets and in shelter and at ongoing risk of the virus. And we know that this outcome is unacceptable. The Alliance offers up a framework based on the components of an effective homeless response system to guide community efforts of strategic strategically plan for these new, newly acquired funds. These components of a homeless response system encompass all the key areas that should be addressed in your community's plan. This framework seeks to ensure that people experiencing homelessness are safe and protected from the spread of the coronavirus. And it attempts to create flow within your system to move people quickly into safe temporary housing that has an accompanying pathway to permanent housing and to keep people stably housed during historic, historical economic turmoil. So our framework begins with prevention. We seek to prevent people coming into shelter or experiencing unsheltered homelessness by carefully targeting homelessness assistance and offering those seeking shelter help to identify safe alternatives to shelter entry. We seek to promote health and safety of unsheltered people while click, quickly transitioning them to temporary or permanent housing. We're seeking to expand and improve temporary housing options so that options are compliant with CDC recommendations, including places for people to be separated, isolated, quarantined, and they're available to everyone who lacks safe alternatives. We're seeking to support formerly homeless households who are receiving rapid rehousing and permanent supportive housing so they can successfully sustain that housing. And we're seeking to move as many people out of homelessness as quickly as possible to keep them safe from acquiring and transmitting COVID-19. And we have a little bit to say about the post-pandemic period, and we'll have a few words about that at the end. It's also critically important that when, we, when communities utilize this framework, they must ensure that racial equity is at the center of each of these components and identify and analyze how resources and interventions are accessed and distributed by race to ensure equity in all aspects of this framework. Utilizing the Alliance's framework on where and how to use newly acquired funds, communities can further support their planning efforts by ensuring that they are assessing current resources and assets to ensure they are aligned to effectively impact current challenges of those experiencing homelessness. They can ensure that they're seeking to leverage other existing funds outside of the homeless response system, including public and private, as well as political capital, where and if it's needed, to address both the immediate health care crisis and to support community-based prevention efforts for those at immediate risk of homelessness. Communities can strategize on how to use new funds to significantly impact the immediate health crisis of people experiencing homelessness and create pathways to permanent housing. In the following slides, we offer examples of how communities can assess their current resources, leverage opportunities to secure additional resources and funds outside of the homeless system to address the current health crisis and to strategize regarding the use of new funds that are dedicated to people experiencing homelessness. These examples also include strategies communities are currently putting into action, but it is important to note that the strategies your community puts into place will depend on your local, on your locality. What we want you to take away is how critical it is for your community to think through your own resources and how they will have the greatest impact. Remember, we want you to think strategically and act accordingly. The first component of our, of our framework is prevention. And our goal is to prevent people from entering shelter or experiencing unsheltered homelessness. And I don't need to tell you what all the challenges are facing communities in the midst of this pandemic. However, we have heard from many of you that some of the key challenges include mass unemployment and inadequate safety nets, 
Um, and the fact that they will destabilize housing for millions um, is already leading to a surge in requests for homelessness prevention assistance, far beyond what systems and resources can respond and meet. We anticipate increase, an increase in the number of survivors fleeing domestic violence and who need safe and immediate places to stay. And we're seeing an increase in people pushed out of doubled up situations due to the host household wanting to follow physical distancing recommendations and increased tension and conflict in the home and all of the other things that you could, you could imagine. It's also important to note that all of these challenges fall disproportionately on people of color. So again, we must consider racial equity as we tend to address them. Given these challenges, how can your community ensure that activities to prevent people from experiencing unsheltered or sheltered homelessness will have the greatest impact? Well, here are a few examples of what you can do and what communities are currently doing. So assessing your current resources, are your prevention funds targeted um, and, and are you bringing them closer to the front door of the homeless system? So communities are looking to deploy aggressive problem solving strategies such as diversion and dedicate the majority of these funds to people whose homelessness is imminent. There are people who right now are unsafe and vulnerable and we need to protect them urgently, the unsheltered, improving the conditions in shelter and transitioning these households to permanent housing. And there are certainly people who are going to be coming our way and uh, housing is unstable, uh, whose housing is unstable and at risk. And we need to bolster and prepare for that. Um, and think about, as we do that, we should think about focusing diversion and prevention for those households in rapid rehousing and permanent, permanent supportive housing first. And in all interventions, we need to assess the racial makeup of your community, ensure that people of color who are most at risk are able to access prevention resources. We also need to advocate and seek non-homeless dedicated funds to help those at risk of homelessness. And some of these opportunities include working with community-based uh, uh, organizations outside of the homeless system um, and working with them to make uh, their prevention efforts more targeted um, than maybe they have been in the past. That targeted prevention coupled with strong social safety net programs um, allow the homeless system to potentially avoid households seeking homeless assistance uh, for households that may be behind in one or two months of rent. And again, focusing in on racial equity, we want to make sure that we're connecting with community-based programs dedicated to racial equity and civil rights and really advocating with political leadership to ensure racial equity responses um, are, are, are being met in response to the COVID-19 crisis. So once you've ensured that the current resources and assets are aligned for maximum effectiveness and have leveraged re resources outside the homeless system for prevention, consider using CDBG and possibly coronavirus relief funds for prevention and diversion efforts. And focusing your ESG funds for stabilizing people on current homeless programs or who have recently transitioned out of, homeless, uh, out of homelessness. And here are a couple of ways that you can do that in terms of strategizing around those new funds. Um, and one important way is really flexing up the problem solving strategies um, and flexible financial assistance uh, that are available uh, at, at coordinated entry points to identify opportunities for people to avoid shelter and unsheltered homelessness. And we're seeing other communities train um, other mainstream uh, partners uh, to provide those diversion assistance and problem solving um, problem solving efforts. The second component of our framework is unsheltered homelessness. And our goal is to promote the health and safety of people experiencing unsheltered homelessness while quickly transitioning them to temporary or permanent housing. So we're seeing a lot of really um, great things coming out of California uh, around this framework, and we'll be talking to uh, some experts tomorrow. Um, and uh, uh, there's some uh, information that we'll, we'll share that comes out around the Project Green Key, uh, which is connected to some of the same efforts that uh, Steve was talking about earlier. So communities are finding ways to get unsheltered people into safe and appropriate indoor spaces, um, and then trying to couple that with paths for everyone out of permanent housing. So again, you already know the challenges, right? There's insufficient 24-7, Twenty four hours, seven days a week, uh, accessible, low barrier shelter for every person who's currently without it. And people who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness still in a lot of communities have no access uh, to tools or resources to meet some of their basic needs, uh, not to mention a lot of the staff reductions that we've seen and an increase in, in telework um, as some of those challenges. So given these challenges, how can you ensure that your activities promote to promote the health and safety of people experiencing unsheltered homelessness 
um, will have the greatest impact? Well, here are a couple examples of what you can do and what you should be thinking about doing in terms of your planning. Again, these are just examples and suggestions. Uh, your own localities will be different, but again, it's important to think about um, how you're going to go about planning for this money as it comes in. So you definitely want to assess uh, and ensure that existing operational funds and organizational assets that might not be uh, currently utilized be redirected to create engagement and services for outreach staff. So we know um, some organizations, and this might be more applicable to larger organizations that um, are running both, say, shelters and rapid rehousing and permanent supportive housing, uh, they are completely reconfiguring their staffing based on um, uh, a decrease in shelter, I mean, decrease in, in staffing and, and moving people around within programs. It's also really important to leverage, uh, again, uh, to leverage political commitments to deploy public health workers, uh, to provide and expand public mobile health care services to unsheltered adults, to um, open up recreational facilities for overnight use, um, in, to ensure people are, have access to hand washing and showers. Um, we want to uh, have these be thinking about moratoriums on sweeps and encampments. And some other communities have also talked about um, emergency food stamps for unsheltered people and getting, those, getting them connected to those benefits. So once you've ensured uh, that the current resources and assets are aligned for maximum effectiveness, how do you strategize and what are some examples of how you can strategize around the new funds that are coming in? So certainly an investment in outreach workers um, or supplies that un unsheltered people are going to require. Um, we're going to hear uh, tomorrow about um, uh, moving people into motel and hotel rooms for individual isolation units for targeted populations. Um, lots of communities taking advantage of um, dormitories, convention centers, and other unused spaces on college campuses. Um, many of you are standing up congregate settings already. Um, and really important, um, many of you are tapping community partners, especially around food insecurity. Uh, uh, leveraging um, what's happening to local restaurants and hotels in order to provide meals and uh, food preparation for individuals. So how can new funds go to support those efforts? The third component of our framework is shelter. And our goal is to expand and improve temporary housing options so that shelters can come into compliance with CDC guidance for separation, isolation, and quarantine. As you know, uh, the key challenges include that much of the existing shelter inventory is not compliant with CDC guidelines or is just ramping up to do that. Uh, often they lack adequate supplies, uh, personal protective equipment, thermometers, and cleaning supplies. Also, uh, being able to bolster um, and lift up gaps in knowledge and information about how to keep clients and, and, and staff safe. Um, shelters are definitely seeing a reduction in staff and volunteers, and um, that reduction is impeding their abilities to meet current program needs while, while at the same time trying to expand greater shelter inventory uh, to meet the demand. So given these challenges, how can you ensure that your activities to expand and improve temporary housing uh, to come into compliance with CDC are having the greatest effect? So um, in terms of assessing, um, are all your shelter and transitional housing units fully utilized? Are they low barrier? Are they operating 24-7? Um, how can you use these funds to help support um, those goals? Do you have a system-wide approach in place for COVID-19 response, or is it kind of piecemeal by shelter by shelter? Um, again, focusing on what is the racial makeup of people experiencing homelessness in the community, and how can we ensure that people of color have equitable access to safe COVID response or shelter that they need? So many communities are seeking uh, political leadership to, to, to make public facilities available to provide temporary housing. Uh, so connections to um, political leadership, public health um, is critical at this time. Um, we recently heard, for example, the mayor, uh, Mayor Walsh in Boston, has been making literal personal asks to colleges and universities, to construction companies, um, to uh, make available medical units for people experiencing homelessness. Um, with underlying medical issues. Uh, so getting your political leadership involved in making asks for these spaces is, is uh, important and thinking about how you can leverage that is, is, is and should be a part of your plan. Um, also, just to say, um, seeking a commitment from TANF resources to re rehouse all families to help families achieve greater safety and free of homelessness resources 
that can be used to assist currently unsheltered people is another really important um, uh, way that you can leverage um, the funds that already exist in your community. So once you have assessed and uh, leveraged what is available for maximum effectiveness, uh, some uh, suggestions that we have in terms of your planning include um, strategizing new funds around increased housing navigation from shelter to create flow out of the system. So spending money on housing navigators and this housing um, search services is going to be uh, critically important. Uh, better utilizing current space um, and contracting for hotels and motels. And as, you're, as you expand your shelter capacity to bring everyone who's on the street in uh, to ensure their safety, um, it means scaling up staffing, which we also know is uh, difficult. We've heard from a lot of communities that, um, you know, that there are a lot of people being un that are facing unemployment right now or un unemployed. And um, we should be looking to call uh, to hire people uh, who are qualified. They might not necessarily be trained in social services, um, but are qualified to help us increase staffing in these new spaces. Um, and uh, that's another place to uh, leverage uh, political commitment. Um, uh, again, uh, in one community that out of the mayor's office, there's a, a, like a job pool of folks and it might even be part-time, but thinking about how we can tap um, uh, other individuals who are now finding their, themselves unemployed. So of course, uh, strategizing those new funds around investment in those critically important supplies like PPE and uh, room separators and security. So um, these are just some of the ideas to think about um, as you plan for those new dollars coming in. The fourth component of our framework is stabilizing households in, within the homeless, within homeless system funded programs like rapid rehousing and permanent supportive housing. So our goal is to support formerly homeless individuals and families receiving rapid rehousing and permanent supportive housing so they can successfully sustain that permanent housing. So we know what those key challenges are gonna be uh, in our attempts to do this, right? It's economic fallout due to job loss, people's inability to pay rent, um, and that's gonna probably require program extensions and the depletion of program budgets. Staff reductions and remote work is going to mean limited access for those who need maybe more engagement and more intensive supports. Um, and due to structural racism and program level biases, people of color may be more likely to return to homelessness from rapid rehousing and permanent supportive housing. So it's important to be watching out for that and also to collect data uh, about some of those uh, so we can, you can track some of um, how those activities are going. So as, as you assess um, your current uh, assets and resources, um, how can you utilize progressive engagement in rapid rehousing case management? So for example, can you flex down case management for uh, more stable rapid rehousing permits part of housing residents and flex up interaction and engagement for those in great distress? And that might mean um, hiring more staff to do that. Can you redirect funds to increase virtual access to residents? So maybe paying for their internet, computers, and phones. And uh, when leveraging uh, existing funds in the community, um, being sure, again, to uh, seek out uh, possible TANF or other state dollars to increase rapid rehousing resources, uh, seek housing subsidies for people who are going to retire, require long-term uh, rental assistance, and uh, it, definitely technology and virtual engagement is going to be important here, especially around connections with medical professionals, mental health workers, and caseworkers over the telephone and internet. So I'm making sure that you are um, assessing whether or not your current dollars are best utilized to do that, whether you're leveraging um, available resources in the community to reach these goals, or whether or not you need to strategize around new funding coming in to provide um, investments, particularly in landlord relationships. So our fifth component of our framework is to access permanent housing, right? So this is what we um, are always working on, which is the goal to move as many people out of shelter and unsheltered homelessness as quickly as possible. And in this case, we want to do that to stop the spread of COVID-19. And the challenges we face are similar to some of the ones we've already mentioned. Job loss and lost income means that households may require deeper, longer lasting rental subsidies. That physical distancing guidelines definitely make it harder for people to return to safely doubled up situations or move into shared housing arrangements. Um, and then staff reductions in the teleworking um, uh, likely is gonna impede, and we're seeing that already, 
housing search assistance and access to needed paperwork to facilitate that challenge, to facilitate that process. So given these challenges, um, how can you ensure that your current activities um, and um, uh, opportunities to leverage um, in order to move as many people out of shelter or unsheltered homelessness are having the greatest impact? So again, looking at current funding sources, um, are, how accessible are they and how flexible are they, especially for people who are going to need to exit shelter and are going to need more rapid exit funds, right? They're not going to uh, be eligible for rapid rehousing or permanent supportive housing. So can we look at dollars um, within our current system uh, to make them more accessible and flexible for people in shelter? Where can we strengthen landlord engagement strategies with individual programs in the system? We're kind of hearing a mix, a mix of feedback around landlords. Some landlords are already calling um, homeless providers saying that they have units and other communities are finding it. The process is kind of slow moving forward and getting, getting landlords to help create that pathway of, out of housing. And again, what is the racial makeup of people experiencing homelessness in your community and how can you ensure that problem solving um, resources are going to be equitably distributed and culturally responsive to, to their needs. Um, it's really important that you're leveraging uh, your relationships um, and advocacy efforts to political leadership to make accessible all available public housing units and subsidies and doing what you can to expedite paperwork to bring those online. Um, we're seeing uh, communities uh, talking about passing a moratorium on landlords being able to refuse to accept uh, Section 8 subsidies. And again, going back to a, a, another um, funding source that many communities use, um, which is TANF, to provide funding for rental assistance to families with children. So you want to make sure that you're at least asking some of these questions as you plan for this money. So once you've done that and you're looking at uh, strategizing around the new money, some of the, um, the strategies that we uh, suggest are uh, certainly making those increased investments in problem solving um, and diversion, uh, rapid exit, so making those funds as flexible as possible, uh, whether that be um, some rental assistance, child care assistance, transportation assistance. It might include increasing uh, staff uh, numbers and training those staff in problem solving skills. Certainly an increased investment in rapid rehousing and all three of its components, housing identification, housing assistance, um, I'm sorry, housing identification assistance and rent and movement assistance, as well as case management. Um, supporting rapid rehousing in kind of all of its forms, light touch, short to medium term, and possibly even longer term rapid rehousing with uh, intensive services. And um, just a note about uh, uh, shared housing programs. The shared housing programs are certainly a strategy um, that communities should consider uh, investing funds in, and you want to make sure, obviously, that those stra uh, strategies and programs ensure that they're, they have COVID-19 safety protocols. So a word about the post-pandemic period. Um, so one of the things that we've been talking a lot at the Alliance um, about is what does um, what does homelessness services look like in the future post-pandemic? Can we go back to a time when 50% of the homeless adults living, um, uh, when 50% of homeless adults um, living are living unsheltered homelessness? Um, where many communities are moving um, the large numbers of people in, off of the street. And so uh, what does that look like when this pandemic is over? How do we sustain any gains that we've made due to this pandemic? Um, how do we return to some of the gains we made in reductions in the number of people homeless uh, to the decreased lengths of time people have spent homelessness? And how do we ensure that we don't revert to uh, what seems like shockingly inadequate levels of care? Where are the silver linings? And we know we're thinking and talking about this at the Alliance every day. And um, we hope that this framework um, provides a um, guidance for you now, but it's likely the same framework uh, that will shape future efforts. Um, so what can we learn from what we're experiencing now? How should we think about assessing and leveraging and strategizing moving forward? So we're going to be giving this a lot of thought, um, and we hope that you will be giving it thought as well, and we will definitely be checking in with you in the future about uh, how this pandemic is changing um, the work that you do moving forward. 
So as we said, it's our plan to focus webinars and other resources on the framework we've proposed today. So um, please see a list of these upcoming webinars. We might uh, be, um, uh, we'll provide uh, links, updated links to these webinars. Um, and I'll, we also wanted to say that uh, upcoming webinars will include uh, focus on research and data collection, uh, policy and advocacy, and other practice-related topics. Um, we encourage you through the, uh, the COVID uh, webinar hashtag uh, to let us know what other webinars and resources that you think um, will, are helpful for you as you plan for this money to come into your communities. And uh, we, um, again, encourage you to think strategically and act accordingly. And we hope to see you actually back here tomorrow. Uh, so thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to continuing this conversation.